So okay. we are recording. No, not yet. We are searching for space in the hard disk. It's, it's a very painfully slow process. Here we are. Okay. We are recording. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for attending this uh, great talk. Uh, we have uh, Richard here. Richard is a principal engineer at Red Hat. He is the creator of the um, LBFS um, firmware update daemon ecosystem. As you will see here, uh, this is about um, some internals about and, and the general architecture of this uh, ecosystem. Uh, Richard is a long time uh, Floss contributor, especially for the Red Hat uh, Enterprise Linux and other uh, GNOME projects, right? Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. Uh, Lots of thanks, uh, Richard, for being with us here today, this morning. And um, let's start with the with the talk. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so, as Daniel said, um, this is a talk about LBFS. I'll explain what all of this means. Some of, some of you might be familiar with um, open source and these two projects. Other people might be completely new to it. So, if I do a, I'll do maybe fifty minutes of like a high level overview of what both projects are. Um, and then for the like the second sort of 50 minutes in the two hours, um, I was going to do a tutorial basically explaining how to use these these projects and actually create a plugin which can write software and write, write firmware onto hardware and stuff. And it kind of hopefully explains some of the um, sort of the way this project works. But anyway, who am I? Why should you listen? So I've been working on open source for about I don't know, like 15, 16 years. Um, I think 13 of them at Red Hat. Um, and I've written projects like GNOME Software, um, GNOME Color Manager, ColorD, um, New Power, um, FWD, um, and about, I don't know, maybe half a dozen more. And at least three of the processes on your Linux box you're using now, um, I'm directly responsible for. And two of them are running as root. So you kind of already trust me. Um, my code's running on your machine. Um, and it's kind of humbling and also awesome that millions of people every day are using software that I wrote. Um, of course, with lots of other people, um, but it's it's like instigated and created by me. Um, this talking, like I can do presenta presentations like this day in, day out, but the whole talking um, and doing like tutorials and things is kind of new to me. Um, so if, if it all goes wrong or it doesn't work, apologies, just be kind. Um, with comments, um, if you want to um, comment as I'm going along, you can use the uh, message chat function. And if it catches my eye, I'll um, read it or whatever. But otherwise, if you leave the questions to the end of the like, first section of presentation, I'm happy to answer generic questions um, or more specific stuff about the slides. So let's go back five years. The problem that we had is that nobody was updating firmware on Linux. Um, my boss said to me, he goes, look, no one's updating firmware. The customers are upset, users are upset, the security teams are upset. Um, can you find out why and can you fix it? Um, and we kind of broke the problem down into four areas. Users don't actually know what they're running, what they're running on. Are they using a SATA disk or an NVMe disk? Do they have the Dell specific firmware running on their Dell NVMe drive or are they using the upstream, say SanDisk firmware? Even if the user does know what hardware they've got, they don't know where to look for the updates. So users weren't going to support.dell.com um, every week or so, typing in all their serial numbers for hardware and finding out if any firmware updates had come out. And so even if, and even if the user did know where to get the updates from, they'd go to the website and the download links would just be HTTP links where you run some random unsigned Windows 32 binary that you have to click horrible like security prompts for. 
with no file signatures, um, no checksums even, not even an MD5 checksum. And then even if you could get them, even if you managed to get hold of the update.exe binary, sometimes the binary wouldn't actually run. So like I have an LG monitor and it requires me to use Windows XP or Windows 7 because it won't run in Windows 10. Or if I use Lenovo's X Clarity tool for my $10,000 server, I can't actually use anything other than RHEL 7, which is kind of EOL now. I have to, if you're using RHEL 8 or RHEL 9 even, the tools don't need to actually run, they don't work. Um, and so the combination of these four things meant that no one actually ever um, installed firmware updates. And you might think that's not the end of the world because firmware used to be this thing where they updated it once every six months and they might add support for new models of CPU or for a new, um, for a, a, a bug fix for using a different PCI card or something. But now your UFI BIOS isn't actually a BIOS at all. It's a whole like ecosystem and runtime operating system that runs before your actual operating system. And so it's talking to your like fingerprint reader and it's talking over your Wi-Fi, and it's doing things like wake on LAN with separate like management processes and stuff. And so actually not updating firmware stops being, I can't run the latest CPUs to literally someone being able to remotely log into my box without even the machine turned on. So it turns, goes from being not that important to critically important, which means that it becomes important from um, government certification point of view or site-wide security policy point of view. And every single one of these four points needed fixing. So I created two projects. One is the LVFS, the Linux Vendor Firmware Service. And that acts as a website, essentially. That's a website where the hardware vendor, either Dell, Lenovo, or one of the people that work for them, can upload firmware to this central place where we verify it and we sign it. Really easy. The, the, the first demo version of the LVFS was literally a PHP script that took the firmware and extracted data. That then produces this catalog of all the different metadata for all the different firmware files and makes it available to all the other clients across the internet. Now having the firmware in one place with all the nice metadata is kind of useful, but unless you can actually deploy it onto hardware, it doesn't, it's not super, not super, super awesome. So the, the project in Linux is called FWUPD and that's the mechanism. That's actually what takes the metadata from the LVFS, works out what updates need applying, and then sort of squirts it into the hardware. Now, because hardware companies are hardware companies and they can't agree on standardized protocols, there's now, I think it's 32, but there could even be 33 as of this morning, um, update protocols supported. Um, and I think there's another five or six in development. So we've support everything from NVMe, UFI update, um, DFU, Fastboot, and even the vendor proprietary ones like Wacom USB, um, Logitech Hit++, um, the VIA protocol, um, and more are planned. And I'll kind of go into why that's necessary in a minute. Now, unlike what the vendors used to do, which was put everything on an FTP site, sometimes literally an FTP site, um, we close the circle. So if the user deploys the update using FWD, the user then has an optional way of reporting back status to the LBFS, either with success or failure. If it's success, we might just get a, yep, that worked, and that's great. If it's a failure, we might request things like kernel version or is secure boot turned on and that kind of thing, which means we can start to debug problems. So if a firmware goes out and it's being deployed 99.999% of the time correctly, we can, don't worry. But if it starts being having a 1% or 2% failure rate, we can dive into those failures and say, okay, well, what is common with all those failures? Ah, all those failures are from Debian machines that are running this super old kernel. So we can go back into the firmware on the LVFS and change the firmware requirements to require this newer kernel. So we don't actually, so we don't deploy updates, which then fail to deploy correctly. That kind of closes the circle. So, Let's take apart FWD. How is how do we kind of use this in your Linux distro? So 
F double T is this as the name the everything in Linux if it ends with a D it's normally a, a system service it runs in the background usually as root um, so F double T is no different and from here we talk from the session from the system level into the session level so the session is the thing that knows um, is the computer being used at the moment is is a bit trunk running is uh, my doing comp calling etc when is a really bad time to download firmware updates. Um, and it's also able to have access to your proxy settings or anything like that that's per user. So it might be that you're using a VPN, which is available in the session, but isn't available in the system. So the session software can download the software, uh, download the firmware from the LVFS. Um, but more importantly, it can grab all of the metadata through the CDN. And so say if we have, let's say 50 million downloads of metadata per day, we can provide that on a geo-replicated CDN for about $20. So without having to have hundreds of servers all around the world, we can just use a really dumb CDN um, for not much money at all. Um, now, yeah, so the um, team does have this Dbus interface, which means that it's um, it's like a, an IPC system, so that anything in the session or, or other things in the system can also interact with this using this bi-directional IPC with the usual kind of like signals, methods, et cetera. Um, and because it's using um, uh, Dbus, we can bind to it from any language like C, C++, Python, Java, whatever. Um, it's a complete desktop mutual la language. Now, I get a lot of comments saying, why didn't you write this in Rust? Or why didn't you write this in Go? Or choose your other um, language of the day? And realistically, the, the project was designed five years ago. And those ecosystems were even younger than they are now. But more importantly, the people that are writing plugins to support additional hardware for FWD are writing firmware in C. And so it's ridiculous to ask them to learn another language so they can contribute to your project. So kind of the, the kind of the lingua franca for firmware is C. But we can kind of add to that with glib and gobject. Glib being like a, a nice wrapper for types and things. So you have like a nice like linked list implementation and hash tables and that thing, kind of thing. And also gobject, which is like a, a really nice object system. So you can do a lot of the C++ isms in within C itself. So you can do things like signals, um, um, vfunks, um, and all the kind of the oop stuff that you're maybe more familiar with in other languages. So if we then look at the LVFS in more detail, it is just good enough so there's no point like with, with with designing an ecosystem like this there's no way you can sit down and say okay for the next year i'm going to work on this functionality to this design because you don't know what the end get, end is going to be you don't know what the vendors actually want to do so the much better way of doing it is get to market really quickly and do like the minimum viable kind of product which as i said the first version was literally a php script which decompressed firmware um, and now we've, we're using um, Python and Flask and SQL Alchemy uh, just because I didn't want to be writing an ORM. I didn't want to be writing um, uh, middleware. I wanted to be writing web service, which would scale out to uh, millions of people. One of the consequences of using the dumb CDN, it means that everyone downloads the same metadata, which seems like an odd thing to do. But if you look at what Microsoft does with Windows Update, when you're using Windows and you say, what firmware is available for my system, you send Microsoft the entire hardware manifest of all of your hardware and all of the peripherals attached to it to some server in Redmond somewhere. And some that's a bespoke query, which then gets matched server side with all these rules about this update can only be applied onto this hardware from this vendor, and this can only be done on this OS version, or whatever. So the server processes this bespoke request, and then sends you back a kind of a custom response saying, download firmware A from this other place, and some firmware B from this other place. Now that works if you're Microsoft and you have literally thousands of servers processing this stuff for all, of, all around the world. But for a long time, this whole architecture was running on a server under my stairs. And that's fine. Like, it, like it's like that as a startup, that's kind of how things work. But by putting the, by making the service decentralized, so all the processing was done um, 
user side than like the client side rather than on the server. It meant the server could be really dumb and the use we could like repl we could use the um, distributed processing power of all the computers that connect into it. And it meant the information stayed private. And so when someone like if a let's say hypothetically um, uh, an agency contacted me and said, look, can you provide me all the people with this hardware with this firmware version, which you can on Microsoft Date, I could say no because it's it's designed to be private. The exception to this is actually getting the firmware. Sooner or later, you've got to connect to a server and download something from somewhere. And you can't always put like, I don't know, 65 gigs of firmware on a CDN. Um, and so we actually connect to the RVFS and like, you can sort of see from the counter, it's like one request a second or something. So it, it's, it's totally doable on one server. We, ha we have a um, AWS multi AZ deployment of everything. But you could do it on one server. It's like one download a second or something, maybe two or three downloads a second maximum, um, which doesn't sound like much, but that's millions of downloads a month. Um, now that means we can keep things centralized so that if we if there is a firmware that goes out that's broken, rather than having to invalidate CDNs all around the world, we can demote it and block access to it straight away. But really it's for stats, because if you go to a vendor, if you go to someone like um, an HP, and say, hey, we've got this architecture, it's being used by um, Lenovo and Dell, and they distribute lots of firmware to quite a few users. It's not a super compelling use case. If you say, look, we've deployed nearly 30 million downloads, and we're doing it for 30 vendors, averaging at a million downloads a month, that's a much more compelling reason for a vendor to join. Um, and that's kind of a really good way of getting vendors on board. As I said, Python, Flask, SQL Alchemy, um, it just needed to work. There's no need to, uh, I call it architecture astronauting, where you don't need to, to build the entire perfect architecture. You can start simple and then a vendor says, hey, can we have this functionality? You add that functionality. Well, they say, hey, can I have two firmwares in one archive? Yeah, yeah, we can split that up and you can kind of evolve the web service rather than having to have this beautiful design that ever changes. So we started the LVFS and FWD in 2016. Now we prototyped it with the Color Hug hardware, which is also hardware that I produced um, for like a little like a hobby that got out of control. Um, and, and the Color Hug hardware was open hardware. We sold a few thousand units. Um, and it was a really good way of testing the server side with a real legal company and the client side on like Fedora, I think it's like 20, Fedora 23 or Fedora 24. Um, and actually see, does this work at scale? Does this work on real hardware? Can, does this work as a system service, et cetera? And then to bootstrap the whole system, I talked to lots of open source hardware um, people, I guess they're not really companies, just people. On the logic is the sort of people that were contributing and writing to open source hardware were the sort of people that could write plugins for FWD, like the DFU plugin was written that way. Um, and they could also contribute missing functionality to LVFS website, which is which both are free software projects and anyone can contribute as long as they contribute them under the same license. And that got me to the point where we did actually have a minimum viable product, which we could um, go to the likes of Dell um, and sort of talk to them with. Dell were doing something similar to like the LVFS before, but they agreed it made no sense to have all of this per vendor. Um, this is something that is shared functionality. It makes total sense to sort of standardize on. And so Dell adopted the LVFS and FWD for, um, I think it was Fedora 25-ish, um, 2017 type territory. Um, and they added support for their IoT and their XPS line and got a huge amount of good publicity about this. They let, like Linux um, was, it, it, this was great for them. Of course, being an early adopter means you've got to do a lot of the early work. So Dell wanted a UFI update capsule to work. And so they had to write a lot of the um, UFI capsule plugin for FWD. They also wanted Synaptics MST to work for their um, hubs that you can plug into Dell laptops. And so they had to, they had to write the Synaptic MST plugin. And then they wanted Thunderbolts. They wrote the Thunderbolt plugin. 
Um, in about 2018, Logitech got hit by a vulnerability um, called Mousejack, which is basically a vulnerability where the firmware on their unifying receivers could be updated, um, could, could be flushed with malicious code, which would turn any um, unifying receiver into essentially a, like an open access point for your keyboard and mice. So you could go to a, ca ca a coffee shop, sit down with your laptop and just essentially write on other people's laptops. Um, and it was kind of serious. And it got to the point where Logitech hardware was being pulled out of various um, government schools, etc., because there was no fix for this for the companies that were running Linux. And so they kind of had to join. Um, so they write the um, unifying HID++ plugin um, and uploaded the firmware updates, which fixed this vulnerability for all their hardware. And although they only uploaded about I don't know, maybe six or seven firmwares. It appears an awful lot of people have unifying hardware um, because they're one of the most popular downloads that's been downloaded tens of millions of times um, over the last few years. Now, Lenovo, I've put here as 2019. That's not strictly true. Um, that's that's when we kind of did the announcement. But I've been working with Lenovo until since maybe just after the Dell announcement because Lenovo didn't want to upload the firmware themselves. They wanted uh, their ODMs, the people that actually build the hardware for them, to upload um, firmware. And the ODMs that built the hardware for Lenovo, like the Foxcons, the Wistrons, the companies that you perhaps don't know, they didn't want to upload the firmware either. They wanted to their IHVs to do it. They wanted their Vias, their Realtechs, their Wacoms to upload the firmware on their behalf. And so we had basically 18 months of um, plumbing in the entire like hardware ecosystem for Lenovo, um, which basically meant that although in 2019 we could say, yeah, you Lenovo, ThinkStation, ThinkPad, ThinkCenter are all supported, when actually it was maybe, I don't know, 20 different vendors onboarding them, showing them how to build the code, how to write a plugin, um, what licensing was, all that kind of thing. But it also meant that Lenovo could reuse a lot of the work that Dell did. Lenovo didn't have to write the UFI capsule plugin because Dell had already written it. They didn't have to write the um, Synaptics MST because Dell had already written it. So other plugins that were contributed by the Lenovo um, ODMs um, were added to the tree, which then Dell could start using as well, um, which kind of meant that the two companies are working more collaboratively. Then HP um, literally found they couldn't sell hardware to some places because some places have a requirement on must support LVFS as part of the um, bidding for contracts. And so they added a small number of um, machines to the LVFS and LVF and, LV and FWD to be able to sell to various government contracts and found that not only could they then make the sale, it was also great PR and so this year they added a, a ton more models, and I hear that a lot more are in the works. Incidentally, HP only had to write, I think, one plugin. They could reuse all the other stuff that was written by Lenovo, Logitech, and Dell, um, which basically meant that by this year, although I've only mentioned like, what is it, five OEMs here, there's 90 different companies all working together on this stuff. And we're all working together which means that when a new vendor comes to the LVFS and says, look, this is the hardware I need supporting, um, how long is it going to take to, to do, how much is it going to cost in development time? And I'll say, look, it's literally all supported. You have to add like a two-line vendor product ID in this file and your hardware magically works. And they just don't, it's just completely alien to them how that works. Um, but it's, it's working collaboratively rather than working as a kind of a, um, a of a separate entity that has to do everything all over again. So now we have all this lovely firmware in the LVFS, we can do some quite interesting things. We can check it. So it might be for something like a, a DFU file, it might be just check that the files checksum is correctly, make sure it's not been corrupted as it was uploaded, or make sure that the vendor ID in the DFU file matches the vendor ID that the vendor has. We can also do some other more clever things. So one example here is we've just simply got a, a block list. So it takes the, the binaries, um, it might decompress them into different things. And then on all the different shards that we produce from a, a single binary, we look for this text. We look for do not trust, do not ship, 
which are sort of common words used by the BIOS vendors like AMI and um, Phoenix and other inside, etc. They use those for test BIOSes that should never be seen by the public. And it turns out that the ODMs were uploading these test BIOSes. Um, and it, it wouldn't be a surprise that the test BIOSes had um, critical security things um, because they're test BIOSes. So we check for those and we don't actually let the user promote BIOSes that contain these strings to, um, to the stable um, um, remote. Another example here is maybe less security critical, but how many times you've turned on a computer, done a hardware scan, and all your hardware results come back as to be defined by OEM. Now, although that's not a security problem, it's kind of a laziness problem. And if the OEM hasn't changed the default setting from the IBV, maybe they haven't turned off the other stuff that's not meant to be turned on. And it's certainly an indic indication of pretty bad firmware. The fourth one is the NSA backdoor, which luckily we've never found, but it would be interesting to find. Um, and I guess, yeah, fifth is uninteresting. I've had to blur out the last one. The last one is to do with um, a type of certificate that maybe shouldn't be shipped publicly, should we say. Um, and it's found a, a cross OEM vulnerability affecting Lenovo, Dell, and HP, where they're using Intel reference codes, um, which, it provides a, a high, a critically important security weakness in all of the BIOSes. And that was slapped down from Intel as an 18 month embargo. Uh, and I've had to blur it out because it's still under embargo. Um, and it's it's a ridiculous bug that's so easy to find, um, but it's, it has to be blurred for that reason. Um, but you can see just searching for these terms in UTF-8, UTF-16 LE, UTF-16 BE, finds these very simple bugs. The other thing it, we do is when we upload a firmware.bin, which might be a 16 meg blob, um, we take that blob and we might look for the Dell PFS, which is the like the, the file kind of structure, and we decompress the PFS. We then look for the um, file volume header, which is like the UFI kind of like it's like a bit like a zip archive, but for firmware. You, you look, you basically decompress all of the FVHs. Um, you look inside the file system in, in the actual file volume header. Uh, then you look for the individual files. And then once you've actually got the files, you can decompress within the files any certificates you find. So here's a really good one where the, there's a, a BIOS um, from a tier one OEM, which ships the Infineon TPM update um, binary as part of the BIOS, which expired three years ago. Um, now, obviously that's not critically important, but it probably isn't great. And so there's now rules on the RVFS where we have speed bumps. So that if a vendor does something dumb, they have to click a button that says wave every single time they do this dumb thing. And just by putting this little tiny speed bump in the process means that actually the person uploading the firmware next time will go back to Infineon and say, hey, can, you have a, can we have an updated version of that TPM update tool? because then I don't have to click that button every single time. And that means not only does it get the re-signed version, we get the latest version with the latest bug fixes, we get the, the, the version that was linked with the latest version of OpenSSL and all the other kind of the, the implications um, from getting newer software. So it's like a really simple thing. One unexpected thing that happened um, was that people started using the LVFS to decide what hardware to buy. Now, maybe that's not a huge surprise from like an enthusiast Linux user point of view, like like a like a me and you wanting to buy a new laptop. But this was a surprise when people like UK government were saying, we want to buy um, thousands of these new machines, but we only want to buy the ones that have regular updates, not just the ones that issued one update just so they get a green tick on a form somewhere. And so here they can actually compare um, hardware, um, like different brands of hardware, different um, models of hardware on the LVFS to find out actually, does the vendor update the firmware re regularly? Like here, the XPS 15 is like every, well, maybe one, one per quarter, which is pretty good for an OEM. But some vendors, like, like I said, you can only get, they might only have one update, maybe once a year or once every two years, um, which obviously isn't good from a security point of view. 
Now, when I started the LBFS, it was really hard to find the people in the OEMs that could make the decision to ship firmware on the LBFS, because I'm just like one random person working in a shed. And I needed to talk to the CTOs of Acer, Asus, etc. And that wasn't gonna happen. So what I started with is allowing the any random BIOS engineer in any random company could upload private firmware so they could test the LBFS. They could see, does this work for me? And then once the um, once the like the BIOS engineer or the QA engineer had experimented a bit and played with this and thought, okay, well, this does work. I can move the firmware to embargo and I can set up an end-to-end -end test using like NEM software or the command line or cockpit or something. And then they could go to their boss and say, hey, there's this thing that I've been using and it works and it could be some good PR for Linux and it could also be allow us to sell more stuff to people we can't sell stuff to. And then their boss would take it to their boss, would take it to their boss. And there'd be some lawyer somewhere who says, yep, yeah, that's great. And then we'd start the legal stuff, which meant that we could check that the vendor was who they said they were and make sure that the firmware is a good quality and it contains all the different metadata that we need. And then we would unlock their account, which allows them to push to testing, which has, I don't know, 100,000 users, and stable, which has many million users. And it was a good way to kind of onboard like big companies without kind of and letting them fight the battle internally themselves. The technical stuff here is all simple. Often the biggest challenge you have from like building an ecosystem like this is finding the right person in the company and making them care about your thing. Um, and this was a really good way to kind of um, allow the engineers inside the company to do all the hard work for you. So the number one question I get asked by new OEMs is how much does this cost? And they just don't understand when I say it's literally free. So the LVFS was designed um, by me and Red Hat um, as a way of making hardware vendors care about Linux users and so that our customers weren't um, subject to these firmware attacks. But then it's kind of grown beyond me. So LVFS is now this, it's literally a legal LLC um, managed by the Linux Foundation with a technical charter and all the kind of the legal protection. So they manage all the like the like the legal and the technical side. Like they're the ones that get paged in the middle of the night if the service goes down. And Red Hat provides me. Um, I manage. I kind of like I built both services and I do most of the development work. Um, and I'm probably the one that will review patches from Asus and Acer and etc. I'll explain more about what that means later. Um, but it's moved from me writing code late at night, hoping that someone will use it, to the Googles saying, how can we use your system? What can we do? So a good example here is Google. The FWD team in Google is now, I think, five people. Um, and there's one of me at Red Hat. So it's, that's kind of mirrored in lots of other OEMs too. Now, of course, I don't scale. Um, I am just like one person with two screaming kids. Um, and so the way this that we've scaled this out is we have uh, independent consulting companies like Collabora, CodeThink, 3MDeb, et cetera. And they can either train companies on how to use the LVFS, but it's a website, it's kind of easy, it's not, not, not super hard. More often than not, what they're doing is they're taking their legacy code they've written in like 15 years ago in C++ and they're converting it to um, sort of new, clean, G-Object style FWD plugin. And this is like, I'm going to need slides on that bit now, but if I explain it a little bit, what used to happen with Linux is if a vendor was being super kind, they would write a firmware updater in some language and they would statically link all of the libraries that it used. And so you would get maybe like a hundred megabyte binary which you could run on Linux systems. And most of the time it would just work. But there's two problems with that big blob. One is it is a big blob. And so if you're someone like Google with Chrome OS and you have say 16 different updaters for 16 different touch screens from 16 different vendors, you've just burnt through a gigabyte of EMMC storage 
on firm data that get run once um, and then they're just wasted space. The other problem is, of course, security. You can't possibly review what this 100 megabyte blob is doing. And so you just have to trust that the company hasn't embedded something in there that maybe they either weren't aware of or that they shouldn't have. So a good example here is like Wacom. Wacom provide a binary, a big binary, which is statically linked. Um, and the Wacom USB plugin in FWD is, I think, 16 kilobytes in size because we can share all the functionality. All of the plugins are doing like initialization, destruction, cold plug, hot plug. They're all doing things like control transfers. They're all doing things like writing files, reading files, et cetera. And so if we provide like a shared abstraction for um, all of those plugins to use, we can have all of that in a nice lib FWP plugin library, which they can all use. And actually, like most devices are all the same. Most devices are um, like, there's only one way to install firmware. So a witty anecdote now, um, there was a, a company that said, we can't tell you what our firmware flash protocol is because it's completely proprietary. Okay. I said, would you let me guess your protocol? And they said, it's impossible. It's proprietary. I said, is it a, do you send one USB hit command to convert your hardware from runtime mode to bootloader mode. Is there another USB command, control transfer say, to erase a block, to write a block, to read a block, and then another command which turns it from bootloader mode to runtime mode? And they're like, how did you know our protocol? I was like, because they are literally all the same. Like there's variations of like checksums and CRCs and that kind of thing. But essentially, all the protocols are very much the same. And so if you can provide all this functionality for do a control transfer or do set report or get report, actually, most of the plugins come down to error handling um, and maybe some magic constants. Like another good example, um, uh, one of the USB mice um, has a, a, a magic signature, um, which turns the device from mouse to able to update into run bootloader mode. And it's a two byte signature. So I said, well, that's, that's trivial to discover. You can just plug in a USB analyzer and there's literally two bytes. And they're like, yeah, fair point. Um, so that's like a, like a um, I guess, anecdote. So OEMs that actually make the hardware, the, the name that you, like the, if you look at your laptop, the name you actually see on the box, that OEM can tell its supplier whatever it wants. So they can choose their own criteria for people bidding to produce the next generation of their hardware. So Lenovo have told all their suppliers um, um, for ThinkPad, ThinkStation, ThinkCenter, they have to have working FW plugins and they have to be able to upload to the RBFS. If they don't do that, they lose their preferred vendor status. That's, that's huge. That means that like the Lenovo's have told Wistron and Foxconn and all of the other ODMs. And then they've said, okay, well, this isn't our problem. This is our, this is the IHV's problem. This is the Realtek's problem. This is Intel's problem. This is um, VIA's problem. And it can, the entire supply chain has to adjust to this way of doing it because at the end of the day, Lenovo is the one that's gonna be building 100,000 laptops of a specific type. Dell have been even more strict. Um, they've said that all their ODMs and ISVs must um, have firmware that's available on the RBFS, which means that like even like modem firmware and that kind of thing is included. That, that's superb. Google have done something slightly different. Um, so this time, maybe like Christmas last year, Google made the announcement that any hardware that didn't work with FWD wouldn't get the works with Chrome um, sticker. Now it turns out that stickers are hugely important. Um, who knew? Um, and just in a month, I had about I don't know, maybe 25 vendors email and join the service because they were so worried about this design for Chrome sticker. Um, so it's kind of great in that more vendors were joining the initiative but also bad because I was supposed to have a week off at Christmas and I was being emailed by lots of um, vendors that were panicking. Um, Google also ship um, FWD in every 
Chromebook now. And the plan is to integrate more deeply into Chrome OS um, as time goes on. Interestingly, Google aren't using the LVFS. They're mirroring the whole LVFS. Um, now, I guess maybe that needs some explanation. The way, so the LVFS itself, um, yeah, the LVFS itself is this um, massive file dump, essentially. And then we give them a, a pub manifest, which allows them to sync all the public firmware. That means that if you're someone like, I don't know, the NSA or... Um, and you want to do it for or Google and you want to keep the, all the connections private, you can do that. Um, or if you're someone like Pixar who has 10,000 Wacom tablets, you don't want 10,000 workstations to download 10,000 of the same file, and so you'd mirror it locally. So we allow that. And I'll come to why that's important in a minute. So what's happened is over the last 18 months is rather than the LVFS being a nice to have and something that Linux users can um, kind of like be thankful for. Actually, it's been cemented in law. So, for instance, the um, that the OEM like ThinkStation will have in their contract with Wistron that Wistron will upload the firmware to the LVFS on their behalf, and then Wistron will have in their contract with AMI something like you must have tested this firmware works with FWD. And so now we're part of all these contracts. We're now Basically, we've built like an ecosystem that somewhat um, rivals Windows Update, um, which also does some firmware distribution too. Um, yeah. Now, like I said about Windows Update, Windows Update is its whole ecosystem on its own. Windows Update is great. You can use it for drivers, um, software, um, firmware now. Um, and vendors also have their own stylus as well. So like the vendor will have like um, support.lenovo.com or um, help.dell.com or whatever. And they have their different silos of data. So it might be that a vendor publishes something on their homepage, but forgets to update Windows Update and doesn't remember LVFS. Or they might do LVFS, but forget Windows Update. And it's important to remember that there are these different silos of um, truth, essentially. Now, what we've we, the reason I guess I've been talking to Eclipsium all this time is Eclipsium collects this kind of data um, and we share metadata with Eclipsium both ways. Um, so Eclipsium will say, look, this is the this is what vendors are made available on their website. And we can say to the vendors, hey, I think you've forgotten LDFS for the P50 system update. Um, and this is super useful. Um, most of the time it's um, benign and they, they have forgotten. Um, other times they deliberately don't do it because some, win some updates um, are specific to Windows or Linux. And then we have to remind them that people dual boot as well. Um, but most of the time they do a pretty good job keeping things in sync. Interestingly, this is only really required for um, say 80% of the OEMs. 20% of the OEMs, including Dell, um, integrate the LVFS with their build pipeline. So when firmware is built on the Dell, um, for Dell hardware, it's automatically uploaded to Windows Update and staged. And it's also automatically uploaded using a robot user to the LVFS. And so in theory, the two should never get out of sync because it's literally a robot that's doing it rather than an end user. Of course, the end user has to remember to QA the update, write the release notes, and push it to end users. Um, but usually that's much less of a problem than actually getting the update in the first place. So the kind of headline here is that 10 million users automatically download, download the metadata um, every single day. It doesn't mean that 10 million users have firmware updates every day. It means that there could be, like 10 million people are interested in getting the latest um, list of firmware. But really, it could be a lot more than that. So we've supplied like 29.82 million firmware updates since we started for 200 different devices. Um, but because we allow people to mirror the entire LVFS, like to um, Pixar, to NSA, to wherever, we don't actually know the real number of downloads. Now, there's various bits of like back of the envelope calculations you can do based on the number of success reports you get back. 
And it could be that it's as much as an order of magnitude bigger um, than we know about. So it's probably closer to 100 million updates. And in five years, that's not bad. And it's something that I'm really proud of. Um, so Dell um, have been nice. They've said it's strategically important for them, um, just from a, a sales and also from a, a PR point of view. And Lenovo um, have said it's been seamless to distribute updates using this new ecosystem. I was actually talking to Intel um, a few days ago as well, and they said if you compare the experience of uploading firmware to Windows Update to um, LVFS, it's light and day. And they said it's clear that there's been lots of love put onto the LVFS side, and it's much easier and um, to use. So I've been talking for like 50 minutes straight. Maybe everyone take like a five, 10 minute break. Um, and then after the break, I thought we would do like a real, like, so less of me talking and more of um, more uh, kind of hands-on thing. So for the hands-on thing, it'd be really useful if you had a Linux machine, either a, like a virtual workstation or a physical hardware. Um, and you can download the slides from here as well, which will help you if you want to copy and paste stuff. Um, but it'd be just as valuable, I think, if you don't have a Linux machine and you can just observe and watch. And I'll explain literally what each line does in a plugin. Um, so yeah, five minute break. Perfect. Uh, it, it was amazing. Very nice talk. Thank you, <laughs> Richard. Uh, let's let's uh, take a five minute break and, and, and return. Also, if anyone wants to ask questions in the chat, like I'm happy to answer chat questions for five minutes. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, do you want some some questions in the in the chat? Please, people words. shoot. People type and I'll get some more. Yeah, I, I, I forgot to, to, to think to, to say that that you you can you can do the the closed caption automatically translation oh, by, by Google yeah, and, and it works really good. So, so, I, so. I talk too quickly. No, 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 no. It quickly. was okay for me at least. Yeah. It was okay and and I haven't been uh, listening in English for like two years. <laughs> so trust me, you don't want me speaking in like, like, like maybe I, I could maybe do this in French. No. Like, like, yeah, but like anything else I'll sort of really struggle with. <laughs> okay, uh, questions, please, um, in the chat. I have many. No one's asked what the bottom two numbers are yet. Yes, so um, I do, that is a diamond cutter. So I've talked about this before the session started and it's actually really useful for two things. So one is I can glance at it and it tells me like, is it still working? Because if the number doesn't keep going up, it's not working and I need to find out why. And the second thing is it's really good for mental health. So kind of in open source, you have an awful lot of people telling you you're doing it wrong and you should have used Rust, or you should have used Go, or you should be using this latest web platform, or you should have been using AWS, or you should have been, like, this, you've always done it wrong. Um, you should have used this interface design, you should have used that, this is rubbish, this is leaking memory, and you have all these people saying that everything is broken. And then you look at the counter, and it's like, you know, what, nearly 30 million, and it's going up once a second, and you're like, well, it can't be all bad, because people are using this and the number of vendors keep coming up. So the two bottom numbers, like the one on the, the, the left of 2,700, that's how many firmwares are available in stable. So 2,700 different um, machines are supported. But the one on the right is the interesting one. That's the um, 4,694. That's how many machines are available in private embargo. So these are the engineers that are testing stuff. But it's not public yet, and that's that's fine. They're they're still getting legal approval internally, and they're still working out that this model might not be released for another eighteen months or something. But that's the stuff that will arrive. So all of those ones on the right will hopefully be in on the left, and we go from having what three thousand different machines to nine thousand different machines, and the ecosystem gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But underneath it, it's just some Raspberry Pi running this LED. Python script. If you want, I don't know, like how, how many, how long people want? Should we give them five minutes, ten minutes? 
So, Roberto, I guess this service can be applied to rely on physical servers. Now, that's a really good question, right? So, you might have noticed in my slide, I talked a lot about um, laptops and peripherals and things. And most of this stuff that I've worked on is all commercial hardware, like the ThinkPad, the XPS stuff. Um, and the reason for that is that you normally get the updates for those machines for free. Now, this year and next year, my goal is to get the server vendors on board. And I'm now working with Lenovo Data Center, um, HPE, and I'm hoping to start working with Dell soon, Dell Server. Um, because the, the problems like, so the, the difference is, is server stuff is um, usually sold with a subscription. So if you go and buy an HPE server from HPE, and you spend, I don't know, let's say 30 grand on this server, it will cost you a few hundred dollars a month to get all the updates for that server. And those security updates are part of that thing. And so the very last thing that the vendor wants to do is give away those updates for free, even though they're critical, like remote access security bugs in their firmware for free. So they don't want to give the firmware away for free, which is what uploading to the LBFS would do. But on the flip side, they can't bid for specific government contracts because the governments don't want to be on this perpetual subscription model where they have to pay to keep their system secure. Because if the system's not secure, then the, the server loses its certificate, which means that it can't be used for, say, credit card transactions or something. Um, and so the balance of... So the companies losing these sales because they haven't got LBFS support versus the amount of revenue that they generate from subscriptions is kind of like this. And at the moment, there's all these pilots going on about could we use um, LBFS and FWD on servers? The answer is technically, of course, but it's the internal um, legal slash um, subscription revenue argument that needs to happen rather than the technical stuff. When they when they come to the right decision, I'm happy to help them. But until then, it's it's um, pretty pretty rubbish. Um, right. How does major vendors re react to the argument of Linux to be reduced space of OS and less firmware? Um, AMD A6. So it's very difficult to get vendors to care about hardware that isn't currently supported. So for instance, like when Lenovo joined, they made it very clear that systems um, which were not available at the time of joining weren't eligible for firmware updates on the LBFS because even testing has a real world cost. Um, and so they kind of, it's like a, sooner or later they have to cut off the line um, and unfortunately, like Intel third gen is going to be kind of old by now. And it, if they by not by not supporting Intel third gen, it would mean that they don't. It's not like they would lose sales because everyone's on like eleventh gen now. Um, and so they'd rather concentrate on the stuff which allows, allows them to make more sales um, rather than the stuff that's already been sold. Which I know sucks as a consumer, but it's kind of I can kind of see their point as well. Um, so what about company-sponsored implants? Do you scan for backdoor and things like that? Yes, we do. So um, what we actually do is a little bit more, um, I don't know, this is maybe not a secret, but when we look at the EFI binaries themselves, we run them against a rule engine, which might look for suspicious, um, like a bit like Yara. So Yara would look at a, a, a blob of data and say, sure, that matches these credentials. We actually go further than that. We use a project called UFR2, which looks at the EFI binary, decompiles it using Radair, and then we do an AAA scan and actually look for specific patterns in the code. Um, now, what we actually check for is super limited um, in terms of things like, you could, we detect things like, um, what's the Lenovo one called? Um, think porn. So think porn was a vulnerability, which was um, an SMM issue, which we can actually detect using this R2, um, UFR2 thing. Um, and the, I, I, the grand plan of mine is we link the idea of responsible disclosure to people like CERT and 
um, at the MVD and things like that. We ask the people doing the responsible disclosure to provide a UVR2 script we can run on the RVFS to automatically notify vendors which have existing firmware. So rather than having to do like responsible disclosure and have 18 months of finding out which vendors affected, we can actually do that all that automatically. Um, but actually looking for um, company sponsored implants. So that's that's really hard. So I think if you fix if you found if you found an answer to that question, I think you'd be a very rich person. Um, I think the number of checks we do on the EFI binaries is going to go up and up. Of course, that doesn't work for non UFI firmware, but then I guess most people care about UFI firmware because it's like a, it's like a, literally an EFI binary that you can run. Does it work on Android devices? Huh, that's a good question. So Android, so yes and no. So when the Android, if, if the Android device is what is something like um, a very expensive, essentially a web, like a webcam, so like a conferencing center, uh, is actually an Android system. And then when you plug it into your laptop, it turns up as a as a as a webcam with a very wide kind of um, field of view. But it's actually running on Android under the covers. So we have got some support for updating that Android device device using Fastboot, but it's not being used by Android, if that makes sense. The other side of Google, Chrome OS, is using it for updating internal devices within Chrome OS but it's not being used for the image OS image itself. So a good like a good kind of like um, um, heuristic is if the firmware is over 100 megabytes, it's probably not suitable for this service. Um, and interestingly, some of the um, some of the firmwares are legitimately about 100 megabytes, like 5G mobile um, devices have a micro um, kernel inside the actual uh, 5G device itself, and that's about 90 megs in a debug build. Are there plans to port FW like in Windows? Yeah, so yes and no. Again, this is really like a good question. We do have a Win32 build of FWD, which runs most of the plugins, maybe about half of them, maybe three quarters of them. Um, the USB ones specifically. So you can actually update USB hardware in Windows using FWFD. And it does use the LVFS. Whether I'm super comfortable with making that into a product, I don't know. Um, because first of all, it's missing all the UDEV stuff and the EFI stuff. So it's not it's not got everything as much as you have in, in Windows, in Linux. And the other thing is if you make it too popular, I know we could scale up tenfold and we could probably scale up a hundredfold we couldn't scale up four orders of magnitude which would be windows because that would be a like, yeah that'd be that would be an awful lot more people um so ah interesting it is a firmware so you have to qualify firmware someone's firmware from my point of view is anything kind of 16 megabytes in size and it's designed to be kind of blitted to an spi chip some people talk about firmware completely validly um, as something like, um, like a, it might be running on a, like a um, Netgear um, so, um, wireless box or something, where you'd have literally a Linux install um, in the chip itself. So you'd have like Netcat, um, Bash, all that kind of stuff. And I'm not so so interested in that kind of firmware, but this that, this could be interesting. So yeah, sure, I'll I'll check that link out. Thank you. So shall I start a tutorial? Dale, okay, it's it's uh, uh, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, we we have uh, enough questions. We have a okay. break. We had a break, so if you are easy with, uh, don't you want to 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 take a, a little break of yourself and, and no, appear in two times just to. It, I, I, this bit, I will sit down for. I'll definitely put the AC on. Okay. Just check the kids and stuff like that. It's it's not uh... right. Oh no, kids are fine. So like, yeah, that's just no worry. <laughs> kids are back from school now. So yeah, they're, they're so I'm out here in a, in a in the garden essentially. So this is like a wooden office. Um, uh -huh. So the kids are about maybe ten meters away in the house. So it's kind of far enough that I can't hear them screaming, um, but also close enough that I can walk to walk to walk to work, and it's it's great. Perfect. So anyway, let's let's do this. Okay. Um, so I put the slides on this link. Um, you can grab the link if you need to. I don't think you need to. So it's completely up to you whether you follow this along, 
whether you do it in real time, um, if, if, if the instructions don't, um, if the instructions don't make sense, or you get stuck, or your Linux stops working, or anything, just don't panic, just carry on watching, I've kind of put some like, like uh, checkpoints in the code, which means that you can kind of um, fast forward to where I'm talking about um, now. So things you'll probably need is an Ubuntu or Fedora Linux install. You can either do this bare metal or a VMware virtual box. Um, I'm assuming you've done that already. Um, you will also need Git installed. I think Git's installed by default on Fedora, but isn't by Ubuntu. And then also an editor like Gedit, Sublime Text, VS Code, Genie. It's literally whatever you like. It's, the requirements are minimal. You'll need internet access. Um, I don't know how, like, I remember when I was at university, everyone would download everything at the same time in some lecture theater, but I guess with the pandemic, it's easier. Um, you need about 500 megs of space. Um, I think that's like worst case. Um, and if I've pasted stuff wrong or something doesn't work, I'm human, I make mistakes. My code doesn't compile first time either. Um, so let's, let's get cracking. So, what I want to do is I want to create a simple plugin that builds a source file into a shared plugin object. And that sounds very complicated, but it's actually very simple. Initializes a test plugin. It enumerates and creates a fake device. I'll explain what I mean by enumerates in a minute. And then I want to be able to use that fake device and accept some firmware and pretend to write it to a device. Maybe, not sure, if we have time. Um, depends how fast I talk. Now, if something doesn't work, or you fall behind, or you're confused, don't panic. Um, it, it, this kind of tutorial is hard enough when you're in a room like next to people, um, let alone doing it with like massive latency across a, an ocean. Um, I've put a link to the slides, and thank you um, for, for, for clicking there. Um, and you can try it in your own time as well. You don't need to do it now. Might might be interesting to listen now and then try it later. So let's start. I'll explain, if, if some of you are familiar, very familiar with Linux, I apologize. If some people are, are um, complete newbies, I also apologize. Um, so let's first of all get the code. Um, so the convention I'm using here is um, the, the dollar is the default user prompt for as a user. Google Meet Bar. Yes, I can. Right, there we go. So the dollar you don't need to type. Um, that's already on your console. And the dollar just means you're using it as a user. If you were a root user, you'd be a hash, not a dollar, by default on bash. So here I'll just do cd and then the tilde, um, which takes you to your home directory. And you can also do cd slash home slash and then your username. Then git clone. Git is just the um, system we use for um, source control. And I'd say 99% of open source projects use Git now. Um, and it's a way of, um, a bit like SVN or um, CVS, but you can do everything um, in a decentralized way. And I'll explain what that all means in a minute. So here we'll just do git clone, HTTPS, colon, slash, slash, github.com, forward slash fwd, forward slash fwd.git. Um, and that takes a few seconds. Now, the convention I've used in these slides is that the bottom right, if it's got a yellow background, that's the console output. Now, it won't be the whole console output, but that'd be roughly the kind of thing you see. Um, and if it's got a white background, it'll be the editor. Um, now, on the assumption that's checking out now, um, it'll take a few seconds to check out. I can then do cd fwd, which is the new directory that I've just checked out. Um, now, Git has this concept of tags and branches. So uh, a tag might be a, a immutable uh, moment in time on a specific branch. So a release, for instance, might be 1.3.2, next one will be 1.3.3, etc. cetera. Um, and a branch might be something that we can all work on together. So I might create a branch like whip forward slash synaptics, and then synaptics employees can um, add stuff to that branch, I can add stuff to that branch, other maintainers can add stuff to that branch, and then we can merge that branch into master or main, um, depending on your, your main branches. So let's assume that's happened. Let's assume you've checked out 1.3.2. 
So the next thing we need to know is that on Linux, most people, uh, most distros are set up so they have packages. Now, a package is just a set of files, essentially. Um, um, by default, when you install Linux, you install all the runtime dependencies. So if I have gedit the editor, I'll have <clears throat> libgtk as a package. I might have um, upower as a package. All the things that it needs will be installed as the runtime versions. But when you build code, um, you need the development versions of this. So it might be something like for U libusb might be already installed, but to build against libusb, I might need libusb-dev or libusb-devil on Fedora. So depending on the um, OS that you've got, just type that in, whether it's Fedora or Ubuntu. And the way this works is we have a big XML file inside FWD, which describes what packages are needed for each OS. So if you're running Arch, you can also use OS equals Arch or OS equals FreeBSD. Um, and it works out the right things you need to install. Generate dependencies just reads that XML file, um, um, blitz it to a, to a, um, a set of arguments. Um, and then we pipe that. This is all one line. Pipe it into XARG which turns all these lines into one long command string. Sudo uh, lets us perform an action as root. Uh, and then the package manager dnf install y means install this, don't ask for confirmation. Um, this is probably different depending on the project you're trying to build. Um, and usually these instructions are in readme.md in the project root, source root. Um, so I'm assuming that that's kind of wearing and clicking in the background now and that you're installing things there. Um, sudo, which you might be familiar with, might not be familiar with, sudo lets a normal user execute things as the root user. Um, now, on some systems like this one, it would ask for my um, fingerprint scan or it might ask for a password or something. Um, in other systems, it might just log the fact that it's being run um, to, a, to, a, to a file or something. Um, so yeah, so, so now there should be stuff installing. And this, if, you, if you're if you already developing software on Linux, this might only be two or three packages. If you've never done any development on this Linux box at all ever, it might be 200 packages. And that's okay. That might be, I don't know, maybe 50 megabytes, maybe 100 megabytes, which in the grand scheme of things these days is like, what, loading Twitter or something. Uh, Richard, uh, sorry, uh, the, the generate dependencies uh, Python script is not there. Perhaps it's, uh, there is uh, something missing. I, I'll try to look it in, in, into the all three of the, of the thing. I, I don't know. There is a generate Debian.py, but, but not generate dependencies. But I'll look for it also. Let me look now. Oops. Put your mistakes. Um, A one three two. Three so dependencies dot x xml. So, so but we checked out uh, one dot three one three two. Perhaps it's that difference. Ah, okay. Sorry, that was a typo. Okay. I think I mean one. What do I mean? 1.61. Oh, where did I get that from? Sorry, 161, that should have been. Okay. So 161, and then you can definitely. What did I write? And it is. I. Next song, sudo dnf. There we go. So yes, so it should have been 1.6.1. .1. Um, actually, that's, that's a good example here, because if you if, if you get stuck like that, the next I think two slides into the future, it tells you to change branch again. So it's not a huge problem. But yeah, that's thank you for mentioning that. Um, right. So now 
all open source projects are designed to be what's called portable. So the idea is you can compile the same code on FreeBSD, Arch, Fedora, Ubuntu, etc. Um, and the um, the compile options will say um, what code is compiled and what code is not compiled. So it might be that for an embedded device, um, like a watch or something, um, I don't want the USB plugins to be built because a watch is never going to have anything plugged in with you with USB, but it might have UFI updates or something. Um, it's other devices might, um, I might say, look, um, this device has no need to support any peripherals because it's a voting machine. Um, so I might decompose, so I might um, select in the build system not to build certain bits of code. Now, there's also two ways of building um, open source projects. One is called in tree, one is called out of tree. So a long time ago, the only way to build software was in tree. So if you had a source directory with like test.c or something, and you did make, it would build test.o and then the binary test, it would all be mixed together. So you have the source directory mixed in with the build directory. And that doesn't work super well um, when you're building for more than one target. And so now most like second or third generation build systems all only support out of tree builds which means that the software gets built in a different place to where the source code is stored. So here, if we do mkdir build, which just creates a directory called build, and then cd build takes us into that directory, we're gonna put all of the compiled code that we're about to build into that directory. Now, this isn't super useful in this example, but if you're building for Windows 32, I could do make dir build dash 32, and I could build all of the binaries as Windows 32 binaries rather than Linux elf binaries or make DIR build dash FreeBSD. And so all the source code stays in one place. It also means if I want to remove all of the build artifacts, I just delete one directory rather than having to go through and delete star.o or star.a or star.la or whatever. Um, and it's all in one place. Most projects now are using, um, like, a, like I said, like a second or third generation build system. So it'll be something like CMake or Mison rather than AutoMake, AutoConf, etc. cetera. Um, and here we're going to tell Mison um, that we want to, the source location is dash dash slash, which it means basically the parent. And then we're going to do dash capital D, that capital is super important. And we're just going to set two things to TMP. Now these are FWD specific. You don't need to know what they do. Essentially, it's overriding um, things that we look up. So we'll ask UDEV, hey, where do I put your things? And UDEV will say, you need to put it in user share. And we don't want to overwrite anything on our host OS. We want to put it all in um, a temporary directory. Um, and so we'll just put it into temp. So you can just copy and paste those. Then we want to specify a prefix. Now, most uh, most uh, configure most build systems support prefix. Prefix is a really really excellent way of saying don't stick it in slash usr, stick it in this prefixed version of that. And so that means when I actually uh, install my project, I actually inst rather than installing it to user local or something and requiring root usage, and also I might overwrite system files. So I might I don't want to override my system version. I want to just develop this local version. I'll put it in my home directory instead. Um, so here I've just arbitrarily chosen dot root, but you can do slash dollar uh, home um, slash, I don't know, prefix or something. Um, and that tells Mison where to put the installed files. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, and then dash d docs equals on documentation, takes time to build, um, it has to cross link and all that kind of stuff. And so for this demo, I'll just do none just to speed things up. And you can see from the yellow text behind, um, this is the kind of the output you should see. There's kind of this um, kind of, it goes through and checks for warning flags and whether options are compatible with each other and that kind of thing. That explains. So that's great. So we've compiled the project and um, Mizen, um has completed. Um, now we actually need to compile. So the output of Mison is this ninja.build file, which you can see in the built directory. Um, and ninja will- Sorry, Richard, one. Uh, just one interruption. Uh, we are in uh, 161 branch. Yep. Okay. 
Uh, oh, I had some mess some problems compiling in my Debian testing. Is it uh, expectable in some sense? Um, Debian. It should be okay in Debian. Okay. I tried. I tried harder. Yeah, maybe 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 you need to install Meson manually, like apt get install Meson or something. Either way, don't stress too much because you can just do um, get rid of the systemd root prefix. Or you'd have, if, and if you have already built, you can just remove the entire build directory and carry on. But again, don't don't stress too much if this doesn't work because we're going to sort of come back. Um, but yeah, this should work on almost anything. You might need to do OS equals Debian for the dependencies rather than OS equals Fedora. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Continue, please. So, um, Ninja actually builds the code. I, I've included dash V. That actually shows you what you're actually doing. Like here, I'm using GCC. But if you have Clang installed, it would use Clang instead. Um, I mean, I've got C, 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 uh, C cache, which means that it, it you can distribute your your compile over lots of machines and this kind of thing. Um, you don't need to use that. Um, you can. Um, and that just builds. It takes, I don't know, maybe like... 30 seconds to build on an old PC, maybe a couple of minutes to build. Um, and then once you've built all these binaries and all this essentially nonsense goes over through the screen, you, you can drop dash V. Dropping dash V means that the, the, the project um, would just um, um, build silently and you'd get like a 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, etc. cetera. Um, and then when it's built, you can install it. So Ninja knows where things go and it will install into the prefix selected previously. Um, so some projects are able to what's called run from source deer. So I could I could run things without installing. Um, so that means they have to be clever enough to when they look when they load their own resources, if they're, if they're for instance loading a binary or a PNG graphic or something, rather than looking in where they expect to see it, like user share something, they look in the prefix. Other programs for other reasons um, need to look in their installed prefix rather than their built prefix. And one of these programs for good reason is FWD. Um, and the consequence of forgetting Ninja install is that when you start working on a plugin and you make a change and then you run it, it doesn't seem to have affected anything because you've forgotten to install it. So the the test you're performing needs to be done on the installed version rather than um, the built version. Um, but I'll explain again in a minute. So let's create a new source file. So we're going to create a FAMUF plugin. Um, by convention, they're lowercase. They don't have to be. Um, so the very first thing we'll do is we're in the build directory. And so we'll create a directory using mkdir dot dot slash plugins slash famaf. Now we need to go dot dot slash because we're in this um, build directory and we we'll actually want to create a new source file in the source directory. Um, and now you can use, and after that you can use any editor, but we're just going to create this file um, foo dash plugin dash famaf dot c. And we're going to add these what, eight lines, is it? Eight lines maybe? Um, now the first include config.h, all that is saying is um, include all the definitions that we defined in the meson.build. So the config.h would tell us is USB defined, is udev defined, am I compiling for FreeBSD, do I support the UV plugin, have I got an ESRT table, all that kind of thing. So all the things that we found out in meson.build and all those checks that were run, we can put those values into config.h automatically. Next line, um, include fwd plugin.h. This is something that the project itself defines. This is like a, like a master header. And from this header file, you then include lots of other header files. Uh, and the actual details of that is unimportant. Um, but it's basically something that all plugins need to define. And if, you're, if you have a project that's designed to run plugins, it's going to have something very similar to this, some sort of top level header that you have to import. And then you can see a this is C, so it's a void function, returns nothing. Um, and this is defined as a vfunc, like a virtual function in virtual uh, fwplugin.h. 
Um, and this means that we don't need a, like a forward definition or a prototype, and it certainly shouldn't be static. And this is an exported um, entry point into the plugin itself. Um, so this is something that a, a, an entry point inside the ELF where we can um, jump to from the plugin, from the daemon code. And we're passing the init function, this foo plugin structure. Now, this is actually an object. It's a pointed to an object called plugin. Um, and the first line in that in the init is we're setting the build hash. Now, this is for, I guess, a fairly good reason. The plugin needs to know what it's been built against. And so if you try to build a plugin binary on, let's say, Debian stable, uh, and then you tried running it in Fedora um, 34, the um, the interfaces it's using might be different, and it might actually cause the daemon to crash. And so to prevent that, we force plugins to say, hey, this is what I was built against, and all the plugins should have this build hash. Um, and so foo build hash is actually defined in FWD plugin. And as long as all the plugins define the same thing, it means that everything works correctly. Other than that, it's just sugar, synthetic sugar. And then the only thing that's of use that this plugin in it actually does is the word, it writes the word in it to the debug console, gdebug. So it's that's literally the simplest plugin I think you can build. Um, now we'd save that file. So um, there's a big save button on the, on the header, or you can just do control S um, and then continue. Again, if you didn't type that in time, don't panic. Um, I've got a checkpoint in a minute, which will get that back. So now we actually want to build the thing that we've just created. Um, now, in meson parlance, um, that would be called a shared module. That's like a, an ELF binary, essentially, which another program is expected to um, execute into. And so here, let's create meson.build. Everything in meson has to be called meson.build. Um, so let's create gedit dot dot slash plugins slash famaf slash meson.build. Um, and the contents of that will be shared module, foo plugin famaf. Now, meson's really specific about wanting single quotes, not double quotes. Why, I don't know. Um, and then we'll include the dependency of foo hash, which is the thing that we built. So we know that we built it all together. The we specify the source list here, which is all the source files, the .c files or cpp um, files that, we've in, that we're including. And then we need to tell the compiler um, via meson what includes do we need to do? Like we did config.h, but where do we find config.h? And that is included from the root inc dir, which is the, which is the build, the root build directory. We also need to include fwd inc dir, which is the kind of like uh, like a like a superclass library, and the thing that we included itself, the fwd plugin inc dir, which is where to find fwd plugin.h. Um, and this is kind of copy and paste into into um, into the, the meson build. Then we tell meson that we actually do want to install this um, this thing that we produce, this module, the shared module, and we want to install it into plugin dir. Plugin dir is defined in the top level meson.build, but you could equally put quotes um, forward slash usr slash plugins, whatever, you can just specify that as a string as well. We're then going to tell Meson what we depend on. So we want Meson to build the dependence. So ignore that. So that's the link with. So dependencies, we're saying to the compiler, what do we want to link this object against? So plugin depth is also defined by the top level Meson.build. And there might be things that all the plugins depend on, like libusb, um, gobject, glib, etc. Um, but if any plugins have any other dependencies, like if you needed to use um, TPM TSS to talk to the TPM chip, you could add that as an extra line in dependencies as additional to the existing shared dependencies. And then we need to tell the compiler that we need to build libfwd and libfwd plugin before the famaf plugin, which we then have to link with. And this is just... <laughs> Essentially, you can copy and paste this. So 90% of all the plugins have this copy and paste um, content. And if you didn't type all that in time, that's fine. Um, I've got a, a link in a minute to, to, to do this. Um, now, 
what we then need to do is tell the build system to look inside the new FAMAF directory. So the meson will automatically look at the top level meson.build, and then it will only descend into directories that it knows about. And so here we can open the, the, the top level um, source directory plugins meson.build and just add the FAMAF directory in there, which means that when meson rescans the project, it will actually go into that directory, find the new meson.build, add it to the list of dependencies, work out what can be compiled in parallel, and then and then it will install the new project on top. So, how are we doing for time? Okay, we're good. So now we can do, we can rebuild the project. Now, because we've edited the meson.build file, the one that it knows about, the plugins meson.build, meson, a ninja is clever enough to notice that meson.build has changed. Therefore, I need to reconfigure the entire project to find these new meson.build files. So doing ninja install, we'll do a new um, um, meson, do a new meson automatically with the existing arguments that you specified. So you don't need to do anything like that. It will then build all the code for you, um, probably rebuilding libraries and stuff, maybe. Um, and then it, it will install the libraries and the new plugin. So I, I, I speak really quickly and I apologize, otherwise I won't get through all this. Um, and if you didn't manage to type all that or copy and paste it or whatever, you can do dash git reset dash dash hard, which will destroy all of the things you've just created. Um, and you can do git checkout whip famaf in it. And that will give you the code that you've seen in the last couple of slides. Literally just those eight lines in, in it, the meson changes, um, and that's it. Then you can do ninja install and install from that. So let's actually run that plugin. So as a project, FWPD has two deliverables, really. One is FWPD, which is the main binary that gets run, and that's the system service that um, owns the debug service name and talks to other services to get the power state and manages all the devices from all the different plugins and does all of the system stuff. But we don't want to run that system service because it takes five seconds to load. And when you're developing software, waiting five or 10 seconds for something to run, every single change you make is slowing everything down. Um, it also means that you might not have permissions to own the debug service. You might not want to stop the existing um, system service. You might just want to debug the one thing you're doing. And if you can turn like a 10 second delay into a 0.5 second delay, it's much quicker to change something, compile something, test something, change something, compile something, test something. You can reduce that down to a second or so, um, which, is, which is awesome. Um, so let's run FWD tool. Now this is a special tool that most users don't run um, because it's used mainly for like power user stuff and developing plugins themselves. Um, so here we're gonna write sudo dot slash source FWD tool. Now we're not just typing FWD tool because if we did that, we would get the system installed version. We wouldn't get the version we've just built. Um, and then rather than running all the plugins, we're going to specify we just want dash dash plugins famaf, which is literally just the one thing. Um, and then we're going to add dash dash verbose. Now verbose means don't hide all the debugging, show me everything, um, which is super useful from a plugin development point of view. And then we need to tell FWD tool what to do. So it's one line, get dash devices. Uh, and this is just one of the commands that FWD tool understands. Um, I'll, sh I'll show another one later um, where we can show. And this will fill your screen full of debugging. Um, so you can sort of see it does all the usual, like looking at your SM BIOS, mm -hmm. finding out what um, your product is, etc. It will rebuild any caches that need rebuilding. It will uh, grab information about components in a silo. But most importantly, it runs just the init function for the new FAF plugin. Um, and you can see fix me in it as a second to last line. Um, and this basically shows the plugins working. We've compiled it, we've um, we've run it, and it's actually producing something. It's, it's like the 
a software equivalent of blinking an LED on a bit of hardware. Once you've blinking an LED, that's 90% of the work because you've realized that you can program the hardware, the hardware's running correctly, the clocks are running, etc. Um, and the actual like 10% of the, the rest of the job, talking to a LED screen or something, is actually very easy from that point. And then you might see a few more lines which say plugins have been disabled or there's various warnings or whatever. But essentially what you're looking for is fix me in it. So that's not super useful. So let's talk about devices. Now, there's two types of device. One is like a, like a static kind of internal device, something like a keyboard controller, something where you can't physically remove a keyboard controller unless you disassemble the laptop and use some a soldering iron to actually physically pry the chip off the motherboard. But there's other things like USB where you can hot plug. So hot plugging is be like the OS is running, you plug in a mouse and the mouse works and you remove the mouse and it doesn't blue screen. Um, that's hot plugging. Um, and some devices which are you'd think of as internal devices aren't. So something like a PCI device is actually a hot plug device because something because if you use something like Thunderbolt, you can plug in a PCI device to a Thunderbolt cable and then plug that into a Thunderbolt port, and that is essentially a PCI pass through. So you have to kind of bear in mind a lot of things um, come and go. Now let's assume for a moment we've got this very simple device um, and it only exists at startup and it's internal to the hardware. We don't need to worry about hot plug, about the device coming and, coming and going. Um, we can just hard code it. And we use this thing called a cold plug phase. Cold plug is kind of a, a, like a generic term for things that already exist. Um, now, if you don't want to type in all this text, that's fine. You can do git reset dash dash hard um, and then git checkout whip famf cold plug and that will get you the same code here. Um, but if I explain um, what each line does, um, so here gboolean, as the name suggests, returns um, true or false. Um, the vfunc name, which is now defined in fwplugin.h, we pass in the same plugin object as well. And now this funky g error thing. Now g error is like it's like a pointer to a pointer, so it's a bit kind of a bit weird already, called error. Um, and the idea is of a G error is you, you set the G error to the failure if the function returns false. So I'll come back to that in one minute. So we have this also funky line called G auto pointer foo device dev equals foo device new. And what that's really saying is create a new object type dev, uh, sorry, of, called dev of type foo device using the function foo device new. And that's all provided by um, the the library. Now the G-Auto point is probably something that you've not seen in C and that's something that's quite new. It's, it used to be called um, auto, auto cleanup, I think they called it, auto cleanup in GCC. It's like an attribute for uh, variables. And what that means is that the compiler is clever enough to, to unref the dev object when the function goes out of scope. And so if I return true, dev gets unrefed. If I return false, dev also gets unreft. I don't actually have to do like a go to out and then it out if dev equal, not equals null g object unref dev. It does it all for me. And this is kind of, I think they call it RII or RAA, RAI. I forget the name of it, but there's like a, it's like a, a, a um, programmer convention, which is probably more familiar to C++ developers. And it's really useful. And it's something that you might not expect when you say a project's written in C to be seeing objects and these RAI concepts. Next line, dead obvious, it debugs um, cold plug. So it basically puts cold plug onto the console. Um, and then we actually come about creating the device. So we need to tell the daemon what the device's name is. This is its nice name. This is the way we refer to it in any UI or um, on, on the console. So we're just gonna call it hello world. Then we need to tell the daemon its physical ID. Now, this physical ID is like, how is it connected? So for a USB device, this might be dev USB 001, or it might be a USB path or a PCI address or something. But this shows like the physical connection to the device. And this is super useful because it means that if you have two identical devices, like two keyboards with the same vendor ID and same product ID, you can um, identify them uniquely. So a good example of why this is real in required in, like, in the real case is say you're running a server 
and you have two PSUs which um, are updatable with firmware. And you want to up, you want to offline one PSU, update the firmware, um, bring it back online. Offline the other one, update the firmware, bring it back online. And if you couldn't tell them apart from their physical connection, you would do them both at the same time. And of course, with the PSU, if you turn them both off at the same time, you have, well, your, your computer's dead. Um, and so we use the physical ID. And it won't be a huge surprise. There's also something called a logical ID. And so if you have something like a Wacom tablet, um, which looks like one thing, inside a Wacom tablet is actually a USB hub with lots of devices connected to it. And so it could be so from one physical connection, you might have a logical ID of RF radio or um, USB hub or tablet itself. You can have lots of logical IDs for one physical ID. We use that information for, um, uh, I'll show you in a minute. Um, we also need to tell the daemon who owns this hardware. And so one of the protections we have in the LVFS and FWD is we only allow vendors to update their own firmware. And so even if someone like Wacom's LVFS account was hijacked, the Wacom LVFS account could only upload firmware for Wacom hardware. Um, and the way we enforce this is that we, we specify a vendor ID um, in FWD, and we also have a list of um, an admin controlled list on the LVFS, which shows which vendors are allowed to update which hardware. So for someone like Dell, Dell are allowed to update um, Dell hardware and some Broadcom hardware, I think it is. So we have to be, the rules have to be a little bit loose for when vendors use their own product vid um, rather than the OEM's product vid. Um, but you can have more than one on each device as well. Then we need to tell the daemon what protocol this device is going to use. Um, now, this is really to stop yourself um, shooting yourself in the foot. So we might say this device supports, one of the protocols it supports is org UFI capsule, which is a standardized protocol. So if we have a firmware file that says, I support org um, USB.DFU and try to flash it to this device, we're not going to let you brick your computer because you've used the wrong file. And it's kind of like a, it's less of a security thing and more of a um, kind of a foot gun prevention. Um, then we need to tell if the device is interesting. And so this is where, if it was an internal device, I could say foo device, add flag, dev, FWD device, flag, internal. And that would tell FWD that this is an internal device um, rather than a hot plug device. And maybe I should have done in this example too, because if I told um, FWD that it was an internal device, I would ask for a different level of security clearance when flashing firmware. And so on the logic is that if flashing my system BIOS should require a higher level of um, authorization than flashing, say, for instance, the uh, firmware on this mouse. Because if I, did, if I didn't have permission to flash the firmware on the mouse, I could just unplug the mouse, plug it into my machine and flash it there. So the, the, it would be security theatre to ask for the root password just for uh, updating a peripheral. But here I have to tell the, 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 bio, the daemon is um, uh, updatable, otherwise it won't show, because there's no point showing users devices that you can't do anything with. Then there's something called an instance ID, which is probably half an hour talking on its own, but I won't, I won't do it now. Essentially, we need to, a way of telling the LVFS, match this hardware with this firmware. And so for a USB device, it might be as simple as saying, this firmware matches vids 1234, product ID 4567. In some instances, it might be that the firmware is specific to the revision, or the firmware might be specific to whether it's a Dell system or a Lenovo system. It might be that, for instance, there's NVMe um, hard disks, which have a Dell specific firmware, which means that they work better on Dell systems rather than the upstream, say, SK Hynix firmware. And we have to be able to tell that the um, device is in this Dell firmware mode so that we don't load on the wrong firmware by accident. Um, and this is, we use this instance ID. Um, devices can and do have lots of different instance IDs. Um, and I'll explain what we do with them in a minute. Then we need to set the device up. Now, this is kind of something that gets done automatically. And a lot of the things that Foo Device Setups does um, is unimportant. But essentially, what it's doing 
is converting strings, it's checking things, it's making sure that the person who wrote the plugin set the right thing. So if I, for instance, did food advice, uh, if I didn't add app protocol, setup would fail and say, you need to tell us what protocol this device is. And you can see with setup, we're, we've got, we're passing it the dev object that we created and also the error. So what would happen is if food device setup failed, um, that, that function itself would set the error um, and that would return false, which means we would also have the error set for food plug and cold plug. So it kind of means that the, the G error is kind of passed from the inner function all the way out. And what you can also then do is you, you add extra information on its way out. So I could do, I could add like extra information from food plugin setup. I could add something like um, G prefix error. Um, I've come from food plug and cold plug, which means I can debug the issues much more easy um, and also have access to the, the error itself. Jira is really interesting because you can have an error domain, which basically says what subsystem it came from. You can have uh, an error code. So it's like a enumerated set of values. I'll show some in a minute. Um, and you can have a, like a string message as well, um, which is super useful for debugging. And then there's this thing called Food Plugin Device Add. And this basically tells the plugin, which is the thing that's passed to cold plug, about the new device. Uh, and this automatically takes a reference to the device um, and then does things like um, notifying all of the other plugins about this thing. So it could be that another plugin sees this device turn up and says, actually, no, it, the name isn't Hello World. It should be World Hello. And so the other plugin could make these changes on the, the, the device we've created here. But actually what it's doing under the covers is probably not super interesting. And then everything's a success, so we can return true. So let's actually run that. So Ninja install this time won't reconfigure the whole project and rebuild the whole thing because we've only changed the one source file. And so we'll only really compile that one thing and then we'll link that one thing. And then we can run the same command as last time. So you can do up, up, enter um, and do sudo sus for it's like detail, plugins, famaf, verbose, get devices. And this time we get the normal init, fi fix me init thing. We also get cold plug famaf. And you can see here, fix me cold plug. And that's what we've printed from inside. And this time we get some more interesting stuff come up. So we've converted the physical ID of dev USB foobarbaz into a shell one hash. It's unin uninteresting what Hash is basically it's it's sort of hiding the physical uh, information from the end user or the or the um, the client. Um, it's being added by Foo plugin. Foo plugin then um, proxies this to a device list, so we can sort of see that it's being added to this device list we have internally. And then Foo main is the either the daemon or the thing that's running the engine. Um, you can see here that we've added it to a like a global list. And here you can see the hello world, the device ID we've just created. And also now the instance ID, the vid PID USB thing, has been converted to this weird GUID thing. So a GUID is like a, like a specific type of UUID. Um, and it could be that the instance ID is perhaps commercially sensitive. And so let's, let's say you've got a USB sound card and there's two versions. One is like basic and one is pro. And the only thing that differentiates them is the firmware. The, the, the what the pro might be, I don't know, two hundred dollars more expensive because it can do echo cancellation or something. But essentially, the hardware is exactly the same. It could be the instance ID which matches it to the right firmware. It might be USB vid pid underscore pro or underscore basic. And so you don't necessarily want users to know that they could just replace the underscore basic with the underscore pro and convert their $200 cheaper device into the much more expensive version. And so this, we basically, we hash the instance IDs into GUIDs. And so when you look at the firmware on the LBFS and you look at all the, um, um, like the traffic to and from the web service and also internally over the IPC bus, you only see GUIDs, you don't see the instance ID. Um, and this basically means that vendors can have this kind of, um, I guess, sort of secretish uh, instance ID format. And here we got the FAMUF, org, UV capsule, updatable. Oh, register just turned up. So register basically means we've informed all the other plugins that this plugin now exists. So say, for instance, if we'd said that the um, new FAMUF device could only be updated on 
uh, and we were on AC power, couldn't be updated on, on battery power. It could be that another plugin as, as, during the registration phase has said, actually, well, the system power isn't a, isn't on AC, it's on battery mode. I'm going to inhibit this device so that it can't be updatable um, until the, 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 the until the um, system was on IC power. And in that case, the state would automatically change from updatable to updatable dash hidden. Um, and it would magically hide it from the GUIs until the system is on a AC power state. So cool, that's kind of worked. Now that's not super interesting, that's not super useful. Um, so I'm running out of time a little bit. Um, so let's, um, we, ha we have got time for this. So we'll create one more vfunk. This is called foo plugin update. If you don't want to type it in, you can do git reset hard, git checkout, whip thumb up update. Um, and this is like the last phase. Um, now, when we actually update the firmware, we send, essentially we send a blob of data um, to the plugin. And the plugin is able to um, pass that data. So if we send to like an Intel hex file or uh, SREC file or DFU file, we would pass it to it like a proper object. But here we're just going to take the data that we've been given and we're going to print it. We're going to assume it's a char star, so it's just a string, and we're going to print it to the console. Um, and then we're going to set an error. This is an example of we're not actually doing the update. We're not actually going to deploy anything to the hardware. We are um, just going to print one error. So I'm going to use the domain of IO, GIO. I'm going to say it's not supported and then give a reason why and return false. And let me save that. Um, and then, of course, we ninja install it again. Um, and this time, we actually want to write something to the hardware. So I'll use echo n, which basically echo n basically means um, echo this to the screen, um, but don't include a new new line ending. Which kind of doesn't you don't necessarily need to do that. But it does does this. And then I'm going to redirect that output into firmware.bin. So firmware.bin consists of four bytes. L G T M looks good to me. Then we're going to run the similar commands last time, sudo, sys, fwd tool, dash dash plugins, famaf, verbose. But this time, rather than get devices, we're going to use install dash blob. And we're going to give, in, we're going to give this plugin, this firmware.bin. Um, install blob, dash blob is important because normally firmware comes packaged up in a cab archive. And this is, we're literally giving it the blob inside. So we just want the low level right to be formed. And you can sort of see from the output here, um, we're running uh, a detach, which I'll cover in a minute, um, and then we're calling an update, um, and we're seeing here the update registered, therefore by Baz, and then the next line, fix me, update LGGM. So we've taken that firmware file, it's gone all the way through the entire daemon, um, through to the plugin, it's been printed to the console, and then we've attached, and now we're doing a cleanup. Um, and that's you, you'll see lots of output if you try this. It's like pages and pages of output because of the, the next slide or so I'll, I'll explain. So if you imagine this, that's the code. Like if you git add that and you submit and you committed it to your own um, git tree, you could easily create a pull request against FWD. Um, um, one of the um, authors would review that and they would comment on it and give you suggestions. And when it's good to be upstreamed, they would include that code, assuming it's all under the same license, as part of the upstream project. And then several weeks later, it would be included in a point release, which would be packaged up for Fedora, Debian, Ubuntu, etc. And then it would start being used by tens of millions of people, which is both awesome and frightening at the same time but it doesn't but this is something that anyone could do like we have people contributing stuff that are um literally 14 years old and they're contributing typos for stuff in the code or the documentation and we have programmers that have been working in the industry for 30 years working for like mega oems um doing the same thing and it's kind of like a level playing field where it's kind of the, the code talks um which is which is awesome. So well done. If you're still awake, following along, um, I'm, uh, I'm nearly done talking. Um, in a typical plugin, there is way more stuff to implement. Like actually writing to the hardware means writing control transfers or bulk transfers or writing to some sysfs file or something. 
but you also need to prepare the hardware. So it might be that you might need to turn off like some low power mode to be able to go into the hardware. Detaching takes it from runtime mode to bootloader mode. Um, so you can actually accept the firmware file. Attach will take it from bootloader to, to runtime. Cleanup will might then um, re-enable the low power mode. Um, so you're not just burning power the whole time you've got the device plugged in. But that's all for another day. That's kind of there is a there is more details on how to write more advanced plugins um, on the fwt.org website, um, where you can sort of see there's a few more examples and things on how this all works. So thank you all for listening. I think I'm nearly over time. Um, that was um, an, an insane amount of talking from my point of view. If you do want to talk to me and tell me how it went, if I have any questions, you can tweet me at HughesyNT. Um, or on my personal email is richardhughesy.com and my work email is rhughes at redhat.com. Um, I hope that was useful to at least a few of you. Um, and thank you. Uh, okay, Richard, thank you very much. It was, it was amazing. Very, very nice, very nice presentation and, and, and the information and, and trying to show the complexity of what you are doing, that, that it's uh, awesome. In yeah, sense, so it, it's it complicated, a... but you you don't need yeah. to dive in the deep end. You can kind of start the shallow end and get, and get more complicated as you go along. Yeah. I, I think that the, the, the real, I mean, there is a lot of, of, of enterprise and, and, and free software uh, relationships. I mean, that that the, 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 the sound, the USB sound card, the, the pro version and the, and the normal version, that is a problem that it's usually commercial. And, and you have to yeah. deal with that. It's, it's so, a people's and marketing problem. So another good example is when companies say that something's like the update protocol is proprietary. And you're like, well, why is it proprietary? And they're like, because uh, we don't know who owns the intellectual property for the code. And I was like, well, that, that's a problem. <laughs> like, you need to know that if you're shipping that on Windows, let alone if you're shipping that on Windows and Linux. So yeah, so there's lots of like, like really tricky legal problems too. Uh, Richard, a couple of, of questions. Um, first one is, um, can you comment about the roadmap you have in mind, uh, upcoming major milestones and features? And second question is, what would you suggest for people wanting to contribute to the project? Um, what can they do? What uh, topics are uh, requiring a contribution and attention? Things like that. So that's a good question. Uh, in fact, there's lots of good questions. So I guess roadmaps. So from my point of view, like this year, I want to get server vendors on board. Like I'm working with Lenovo, HPE, Dell, and I'd love to get the server stuff. That's kind of a huge missing piece, which governments are screaming for. Like people spending like tens of millions of pounds on servers want this stuff yesterday. Um, so I'm working really hard on that. Um, Milestones for the LVFS. I think we need to integrate the LVFS with um, coordinated disclosure better. So, for instance, what I'd love to see is for rather than a virus, rather than a, a malware author finding some sec critical security vulnerability on Intel, say, and then just dropping a zero day on cert, they drop a zero day on cert and they provide a Yara script or a UFR2 script, which allows us to inform all the vendors that are affected automatically so rather than going uh, having overworked security for some PSA group to have to reverse engineer the uh, uh, proof of concept on off the zero day we can automatically scan all the, the binaries that we already have on the obfs notify the affected vendors and then set like a like a coordinated disclosure group up using cert um rather than mvd or something that's kind of how i see that that is the, the future, like in the, like the next year or two. Um, and what was the second question? I missed the second bit. The other one was how to contribute. Ah, um, so that's excellent. So the best way of contributing is compiling the code, finding it doesn't work, um, submitting a, uh, an issue, maybe submitting a, a pull request. Um, look, even just talking about this stuff to like colleagues, friends, whoever, and saying, look, there's this cool new project. And then you tell someone and explode on your system. It, it, you have um, a good example here was someone found that if you had two identical NVMe drives with the same serial number, the NVMe plugin exploded. And they contributed a fix, and that went out to all of the distro users and was being used by 
hundreds of millions of people within a week. Um, and so I think it really is like find, find a bug, scratch it. Also, if you want to have specific hardware implemented, it seems like it used to be the case where um, I would go to companies and say, look, will you support this project? This is awesome. We've done millions of firmware updates, et cetera. Um, will you help us? And they're like, yeah, maybe. And now it's a case of the companies coming to us and saying, look, we, we have to do this. Please give us the steps to do this. And I think it'd be really useful for end users to say, I'm running Linux. I would have bought your product if you had support on the RBFS. Do you know it exists? Are you already working on this? And even if, like, the, realistically, most vendors are working on it already, but it's like, what, 4,000 firmwares are sitting there in private or embargo, and I'd like to see those in public so people can actually deploy them. So, yeah, kind of, it's a bit of a fuzzy answer for you. It's okay. Are there, for example, any outstanding issue right now? Um, any bugs? So if you go to the FWD um, GitHub page, so github.com FWD, um, there's a whole discussions page. There's the issues which you can go through. And some of those issues are really easy fixes, like like typos and missing like missing features or something it doesn't work on, um, I don't know, um, it doesn't work on Arch or something. So some of them are... Um, easy. Some of them are a bit more um, in depth, but it might be that some people have knowledge of these in depth things. Like if you if you've just done a PhD in um, I don't know five G modems, then you might have an awful lot to say about the safe way to update five G modem firmware. So kind of just jump on. And similar with L with LVFS as well as a project. Like if you if you found something, like I, was, I was talking to Nicholas about the. Um, uh, the vulnerability um, scanner thing. That's super interesting. So I'm going to contact that guy from Birmingham Uni and say, can we work together? So just from that one little, have you seen this? That might be a whole new feature that we can implement on the LDFS. Okay. Uh, more questions from, from the public? The audience. So I need to I sit have... in a dark room and drink some coffee. <laughs> like... yeah. No, I have I have a one question. Uh, we we here in Argentina have a lot of deprecated hardware, and uh, how and Linux is very very uh, friendly to deprecated hardware. It, but what about the efforts of trying to bring at least the the, the latest updates to to firmware update and LF, uh, LBFS? To, to live, I mean, trying to, to, to get the most of all that very old Howard. So it comes down to like LVFS will only be successful in making the OEMs do anything if it can do one of two things. It can either stop them selling to someone they've already sold to before, or it can let them sell to companies that they've never sold to before because of a compliance reason. So if we can either open a market or potentially warn them that we will close a market, we can make them do stuff because this stuff costs them money. Like even if it's managers sitting in a meeting and saying we need to get legal to check this, it's going to cost them money. So getting them to care about hardware that's like three years old is hard. Getting them to care about hardware that's 10 years old is super hard. Okay. And community, I mean, perhaps, for example, we have millions of, 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 of Intel class made laptops uh, distributed in Argentina because of our government give them for free to the to students. Can, can we do something to update that? Tricky. So that's a good question and it's legally very difficult because the only pe person that has rights to distribute that firmware or grant rights to the distribution of that firmware is Dell. So there's no way that any random user can download something from support.dell.com and then upload it to the RBFS because that Dell hasn't agreed for that redistribution. So will that be awesome to sort of like community crowdsource almost firmware updates? It's not something that's legally possible. Okay, but, but what's but, something but, that is possible, which I think is your mm -hmm. next question, is you could download that update and you could sign it with your university signing key and then distribute it on a private like NFS share or something and then deploy it to thousands of devices. That's something that Google talks about doing, where there's devices that will never leave Google campus. There's no point uploading them to the RBFS because they're, it's not something that they sell to the public, but there are thousands of them at Google. What? How do they distribute firmware for that? 
and I would say you self you generate a certificate, self sign it, and then deploy it internally using like either a Apache web server, or SMB okay. share, or something. Okay, uh, but but if I take the risk, I can I can uh, um, install a LBFS server yeah. and, and upload the, the 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 thing there and and do the people please so, uh, please I'm update with. Creating a whole new LVFS is totally allowed. It's just a ton of work because it's like a microservice architecture. So there's about, I don't know, three or four containers you need. And it's it's really hard to make an H high availability service as well. So like we're running on ECS uh, and it's know, maybe like a dozen containers or something. It's, it's insane. The much easier thing to do is you just self sign the firmware, you put them in a folder somewhere and you run a script which generates all the metadata for that those 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 firmwares mm -hmm. then the only tricky bit is because each client has to trust you so you have to distribute the certificate you signed firmware with to every single client that's going to download them uh, otherwise you're going to get this big thing saying this firmware is not signed we don't trust it you shouldn't trust it either um but if you can get your signing certificate on the pcs that you probably own anyway that's not a problem Okay, thank you very much. Uh, your 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 software perhaps solves us our our us a big problem because yeah, we maybe. have like so, millions we... of blood uh, of blood netbooks because of of some TPMs. Yeah, so that's like it's a super useful use case as well, and that is exactly the sort of thing I would say you open up on the LV, uh, on the LVFS bug tracker and say, look, this is our use case. What tools have you got? And if the documentation, if, because we can do that, and we've got some documentation, but the documentation is pretty rubbish. But the issue will force us to write the documentation, which would mean that it unlocks other companies or other universities like you guys, which would mean that you can update hardware, which means they are not insecure anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question, and we are done. Go for it. There is one more question from Josias. So the automatic authorization is corrupted in the least of SO. What's SO, ah, sorry? Okay. Always. Oh, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. So firmware, like, yeah. So if you can get Linux onto the system, it should be easy enough. And it's got a, a fairly recent, as long as you've got UFI BIOS, it should be possible to even using the commands I showed you the FWMG uh, tool um, install blob will actually install a capsule as well so even if you can download the .cap file from support.dell.com you can still use all this infrastructure to deploy it so even if you don't want to go through the hassle of signing the file generating the metadata releasing it, all kind of stuff you can just write an answer script which takes the cap the capsule file itself Ansible or Puppet or something, which means that the device goes from being insecure, unusable to kind of just old but secure, um, which might be an option too. So if anyone has got any comments on the talk, Twitter would be great because this is new to me and like I, I didn't know if I pitched this like too hard or too easy or what. Uh, comments. One one of mine. I got lost because I I get Debian testing in my in my laptop and and it, it, there was some missing package in in, in the in the oh it might have installation but Ubuntu or Fedora ah okay <laughs> Debian still work it okay say Roberto I, I'm I'm just a little bit newer than Roberto but actually that's a really good feedback so if you can put that onto the FWD um, issue track and say look I ran generate dependencies on Debian and it didn't do the right thing. Okay. That's something we could fix. Well, in fact, that's even better. That's something that you could fix. <laughs> yes, of course. Yes. Yes. I'll yes. happily review it. <laughs> okay, good. And, and the, the first part was was uh, was amazing. Really, really, really good. I, I love the way you, you give presentations. Thank you. And awesome. I, I'm I'm very kinky. And also, Josias, I, I can see your message about using Manjaro. If you want to add the dependencies required for Manjaro to that XML file, that's also something I would accept because 
no, like I kind of I, I'm paid for Red Pipe to work. I'm paid on this to work on Red Hat stuff, but obviously everyone's not running Red Hat stuff. So if you wanted to run Manjaro, just find out the packages, which are probably mostly the same as either the Fedora or the Debian ones. Um, get it working and then submit a pull request, um, and it should be close enough. Yeah, I think Arch is different enough to Manjaro at this point. But yeah, anyway, yeah. Thank you all for listening. Okay, no, thank you very much. It was it was uh, very insightful, and and um, thank you for for concentrating in, in a very <laughs> small group like, of, like of my, a very 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 far away country in in the world. No, it's no problem at all. Like I'm not used to like I'm sort of used to sitting in silence in this room by myself. So for talking for two hours is just insane. <laughs> Thank you very much, yeah. Richard. Thank you. Uh, no I'll worries. Stop, uh, okay. Bye-bye. Cool. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.